Hey there, marketing analytics students. In this video, we're going to look at the overall performance of a prediction model that we've constructed. Particularly, we're going to learn about the confusion matrix. And we're going to find out that it's a totally excellent tool. Our learning objectives for this video is to familiarize ourselves with one of the most common outputs that we see when we perform a categorical prediction model, the confusion matrix. We're also going to learn how to interpret and calculate some of the common metrics that come from a confusion matrix. We're also going to learn about some of the trade-offs a marketer can make about the performance of a prediction model based on adjusting the thresholds or cutoff points of a prediction model. We're going to relate the results of a confusion matrix into a few practical insights for marketers, and we're going to refresh ourselves about why marketers care about prediction model performance in the first place. While this video is focusing on the confusion matrix, Let's recall from previous videos that the prediction analytics tool that we've used so far is logistic regression. The point of logistic regression is when we have one or more inputs or independent variables or predictors, whatever we call them, and our goal is to predict an outcome. And in particular, this outcome is two different categories. In the scenario that we've been working with, we've been imagining we're trying to figure out whether or not a salesperson will make a sale or won't make a sale. So again, we're going to be using the cold call case uh, example that we were using in previous videos with a slight modification. Our output is still whether a sale was made to a business or no sale was made. For our input predictors, we still have whether or not the person that was cold calling the business was a veteran employee or a new hire. Veteran employees are coded as one, new hires are coded as zero. The number of cold calls that they made to that firm, ranging from two to 32, in a new uh, input was added in this particular scenario, we also know whether or not the salesperson in question attended a sales conference. A one means they did attend a sales conference and a zero they didn't. We're thinking maybe if they attended a sales conference, they improved their skills. In this scenario, someone has already objectively calibrated our logistic regression model for us, meaning that these parameters have been calibrated. Thanks, whoever that was. Our goal in this video is to see how well our prediction model performed. Basically, we want to know, does it make good guesses about whether or not a sale will occur? Let's take a look at the data that we'll be dealing with. There's 50 records in total. Each row represents a particular business and whether or not a sale was made. First column indicates whether the salesperson that was selling to that business was a veteran or new hire. This column indicates the number of cold calls that was made to that business. And this column tells us whether or not the salesperson that was selling to that business actually attended a sales conference recently. And then finally, here's our dependent variable, the outcome we want to predict, whether or not someone actually made a purchase from that company. Since our model was already calibrated, we can already make predictions. We use this equation to derive these two columns. Let's illustrate that really quick. Let's zoom in on one of the particular record, records to understand where these predictions came from. First, we inputted the number of cold calls that this person made, 20 the fact that they are a new hire, so coded as zero, and that they did attend a sales conference, a one. With a little bit of math and a little bit of more math, we now understand where that value of 63.4% came from. If you happen to actually solve the equation that you see on the screen right now, you'd have derived a value of 62.94%. This small difference is just due to rounding errors in the betas. These betas actually went out way longer than the two decimal points that you see here on the slides. Nothing to worry about. Finally, we apply the traditional prediction rule. If the prediction is above 50%, we predict the outcome of interest, in our case, a sale, otherwise not. And since 63.4% is greater than 50%, we actually make the formal prediction that this person would successfully make a sale. And that would be wrong. In this case, we actually know what happened, and we know this person failed. So in this particular instance, our model did not do a very good job. But now let's zoom out and take a look at all of the records. We don't always make bad predictions. Sometimes we get it completely right. When our prediction matches the actual truth, and these are the outcomes of interest, we call that a true positive. In other cases, we did predict that someone wouldn't make a sale, and they did in fact not make a sale. This is also correct, and we call this a true negative. And of course, we're also wrong sometimes. Sometimes we predict that a sale would be made, but in reality, we failed. That's a false positive. 
And sometimes we predict that a sale won't be made, but it really was made. That's a false negative. If we aggregate these types of accurate guesses and inaccurate guesses, we derive something called a confusion matrix. Notice here is our number of true positives. We had 18 of 50. Here's our true negatives, 12 of 50. Here's our false positives. We predicted that there were 11, but in reality, uh, the same 11, there was no sale. In our false negative here, we had nine in total, nine out of 50. We can use the results of a confusion matrix to derive some informative metrics to see how well our model predicted overall. First, let's take a look at this thing called the naive model accuracy. The naive model is a way of assessing how well we would have done if we didn't build a prediction model at all. In a naive model, we simply look at the actual occurrences and we select the group that occurred most frequently. In this instance, it turns out that we made more sales than we didn't make sales. In reality, we made 27 in total. You take 27 and divide it by 50, you get 54%. In other words, if we simply had guessed that everybody would make a sale, we would be right 54% of the time. A naive model is often not that correct, but it really depends on this, uh, the condition that you're trying to predict. For example, if I just simply guess that every single person liked pizza, my naive model would be extremely correct. And that's because pe most people really like pizza. Now let's see how our actual prediction model performed. Well, here's our correct guesses. We had 12 and 18 correct guesses. If you add 12 and 18 together, you get 30. 30 divided by 50 is 60%. So overall, our model was accurate 60% of the time. Here we can conclude that our model wasn't perfect, but it was better than just naive guessing. We improved our overall accuracy by six percentage points. Now let's zoom in a little bit more on some of the specific actual outcomes and see how well we were at guessing them. Notice here that there were 27 people who in reality actually derived a sale. We guessed 18 of those 27. If we take 18 and divide it by 27, we get 66.7%. This is called model sensitivity, an important metric that is commonly reported with confusion matrices. Remember, the group making a sale was the group that we were focused in. We really wanted to know how well we did. What we can say is amongst all those businesses that there were actually was a sale made, we correctly identified 66.7% of them. Again, keep in mind, our denominator has changed here. We're only focusing on those people who actually made a sale. On the other hand, there were 23 times where no sale actually occurred. We correctly guessed that 12 out of those 23 times. If we take 12 and divide it by 23, we get 52.2%. This is our model specificity. So this is for the target group that we are not interested in, or less interested in, I should say. We were less focused on the no-sale group. Now, all of these metrics that we just calculated were all based on the assumption that we that any time the model predicted that someone had a greater than 50% chance, we predicted that there was going to be sale, and if it was lower than 50% chance, that there was no sale at all. This might lead to another question. Why do we always cut, set the cutoff threshold of 50%? Do we always have to do it that way? And the answer is no. We absolutely do not have to live in a world where the cutoff threshold is always at 50%. This is indeed the default cutoff point in most prediction models. Unless someone tells you explicitly otherwise and they present to you the results of a prediction model, assume that the cutoff threshold was in fact 50%. But you can change it. If you look at the table on the right-hand side here, I've actually altered the cutoff threshold from 50%, and then I've lowered it five percentage points, and I've increased it five percentage points. Let's take a look at this 70% here. 
What I'm saying by changing the cutoff threshold to 70% is that I won't declare that someone successfully makes a sale until I'm at least 70% certain that, the, that they will make a sale. If I increase the cutoff threshold, I've become more stringent about identifying someone as making a sale. What that's going to do is it's going to lower my model sensitivity, but it increases my model specificity. By becoming more stringent, I'm less inclined to actually call someone, uh, identify someone as making a sale. So my sensitivity to detect them has decreased, but I become better at detecting, correctly detecting those people who won't. On the other hand, if I lower my threshold, meaning I'm becoming a little more willing to identify somebody as making a sale, even though I'm not as confident about it, my sensitivity increases. Since I'm more willing to identify somebody as making a sale, I will in fact be better at identifying them, uh, identifying those people who really did make a sale. This comes at the consequence of me losing my model specificity. Here's another way of looking at that. Look at this scatter plot here. Each one of the dots in the labels above represent cutoff thresholds. So here's 50%, the default normal cutoff threshold that we set. Here's 35% and 30, and here's 70 and 75. On the x-axis is model sensitivity. 100% sensitivity is the highest value we can have. And on the y-axis is model specificity, where 100% specificity is the highest we can have. Notice that there's a trade-off. With our model, if we want more sensitivity, we lose specificity. Or if we want more specificity, we lose sensitivity. So yes, we can alter the cutoff threshold, but it always comes at an expense of trading off between these two different performance metrics. Here's usually the point where someone asks, well, what if I want both? What if I want to improve my sensitivity of my model and improve my specificity? Meaning, I'm better at detecting both true positives and true negatives. Well, you can't do that by just sliding around the cutoff threshold. What you have to do is you actually have to build an entirely new, entirely superior prediction model. But what exactly does it mean to build a better prediction model? When I say that, I, I'm saying that we're still going to be using the same 50 records that we started with, but now we're going to try to build a model that outperforms the one that we had previous. There's a variety of ways we might do that. I just want to highlight the three most common. First, a way to build a better prediction model is to add better, more useful predictors to the model, if we have those available. For example, Maybe we actually know each employee's annual review rating. That review rating might give us a good indication of whether or not they're likely to make a sale. Another option is to alter the original predictors with some sort of nonlinear transformation. We haven't talked about this idea much this semester, but as one illustration here, rather than just put in the raw number of cold calls, a nonlinear transformation would be to take the square root of the number of cold calls. It is possible that this version of the predictor outperforms bringing it in as a raw, uh, a raw unmanipulated variable. Finally, and again, we haven't talked about, uh, talked about it this semester yet, is we could use an entirely different approach to a classification prediction. We've only used logistic regression in the examples thus far, but there's a lot of other approaches to classification prediction. There's decision trees, support vector machines, k-nearest neighbors, neural networks, and a bunch of other ones. We don't need to worry about what they are, we just need to be aware that other approaches exist. It's entirely possible using the same set of predictors, but using a different prediction model approach might result in a better overall prediction. There's another important takeaway now that I've highlighted that there's other forms of prediction models. This confusion matrix that we just talked about in this video is not just a logistic regression thing. It's something that you'll see in any situation where we do categorical classification predictions. As we're wrapping up our video, another thing we should ask ourselves are, wait, why are we even doing this in the first place? Usually a few attentive individuals ask the following question. Why are we even worried about the predictive accuracy of our, mo and of our model if we knew which people would already result in failure or not? Meaning we did have a sale, we didn't have a sale. 
we could literally just look at the 50 results and we would know with 100% accuracy if there was a sale or if there was no sale. So what's the point of all this? This is where we have to take a step back and remember, our goal is to build a prediction model to predict the unknown future. In the future, we don't know whether a sale will or won't happen. Instead, all we can do is build a prediction model that can make an informed prediction about what we think is likely to happen. The assumption here is that a prediction model that is good at predicting the data that it has seen, meaning in this case the 50 records that we observed, should in general be better at predicting the unknown future. So that's why we spend so much time assessing the performance of a prediction model versus the actual truth that it's already observed, and using things like the confusion matrix. In summary, we learn about true positives, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives. We learned what a confusion matrix is and the information it contains. We learned how to calculate and interpret common model prediction performance metrics. We learned about the idea of the cutoff point and learned the trade-off between sensitivity and specificity when you alter it. We learned why we place so much effort into building predictions for outcomes we already know. It's to predict the unknown future. What we haven't done yet is we haven't actually built one of these prediction models ourselves. In the next videos, we're gonna start constructing these actual prediction models. Cool.